my friends. It is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Renee Windham. I've known Renee for not very long. In fact, I first met her during Jane Ray Vale's Biner, and I immediately appreciated Renee's warm and friendly personality. Of course, we became friends at first sight. However, besides being such a nice person, Renee has had an impressive career. First of all, she has a strong background in radio and TV, public speaking, motivational speaking, teaching and adult training. She taught English at Nisi University for three years, was visiting lecturer at Exeter University where she taught leadership and employability. She taught TEFL and ESOL at South Devon College and worked for the British Council in Exeter and Bristol. She led motivational courses in Vienna with the OSCE and in Strasbourg for the European Court of Human Rights. A passionate communicator, she had a long career in broadcasting on international radio and TV starting at the BBC, then at TV, Euronews, Art and Art. On top of all this, Rene has done many other amazing things in his life that would have been too long to list. So now I'd better leave the floor to Mrs. Renee. So in this interactive webinar, we'll think about how even during a pandemic, we can feel joy, fun, and surf the wave of life. And I hope there will be a way of uplifting you by the end. First, we'll be looking at some academic theory about people who've uh, got theories about happiness and positive psychology. Then we'll be doing um, some PowerPoint, looking at a few ideas of how to be happier. In between, there'll be a few little exercises, a bit of light relief to keep you there. Um, and at the end, the most important bit for me is a discussion with all of you. So I hope I don't dazzle you with uh, too many facts, but I want to give you some useful information first. You can even take a pen if you want to get a few ideas. The Oxford Dictionary defines fun as behavior or activities that are not serious, but are meant to be enjoyed. Some people think that happiness is too frivolous. In fact, the movement Action for Happiness, when they approached government, have had to change the word to well-being because happiness was considered too frivolous. Very often, fun is thought of as something rather inferior to being serious. If you want to be a serious actor in the UK, you want to act in heavy Shakespearean plays rather than in comedies. If you're an academic, you want to be serious rather than writing frivolous articles. If you're doing exams at school or university, we have to be serious. And yet, my argument is that fun, joy, happiness is what is really what mankind should be there for, to make each other happy and to make the world happy. Apparently, I heard on the radio this morning, by coincidence, that the happiness level in Europe is at its lowest level for 10 years. I mean, that could be COVID, but it's really sad to hear that. So, um, and not surprising, there are so many doom and gloom things. There's COVID, of course, there's masks, and uh, as we all know, there's tsunamis, there's wars, there's um, terrorism, Brexit for us, redundancies, shops closing. So no wonder people are feeling a little bit down. And maybe, sadly, some of us even know somebody who we have lost through COVID. So some of us might be feeling survivor's guilt you might be feeling guilty that you are here and well and happy and healthy and somebody you know or are, is ill with COVID or even worse has gone. But survivor's guilt was very common in the war, but guilt and anxiety don't actually change the situation and they don't improve anything either. And nor does worry. So if you're inclined to worry, a useful saying is today is the tomorrow I worried about yesterday. Today is the tomorrow I worried about yesterday. 
So today we're majoring on the opposite. We're majoring on fun, joy, and well-being. We need to make a happier world, feel good about ourselves, feel gratitude, feel glad to be here. And when we create happiness, we also feel happy in ourselves to create. It's also important to have self-care to look after ourselves so that we can be strong enough to give happiness to others. So how do we analyze what's going on in yourself when you're happy or other people are happy? Well, many academics in positive psychology have spent decades actually trying to work out some of what I'm trying to tell you today. Professor Richard Layard, for one, Erich Fromm, Henri Bergson, Martin Seligman, all of them looking at happiness and joy. So before I start, one good way is to sit up and what my dance teacher calls, smile with your collarbones, with your clavicle. It always helps, think of smiling from there and immediately you feel lifted. I know I do. Professor Richard Layard um, is from the London School of Economics. I've been to some of his lectures and he describes well-being as, you might tick these off in your head in this list, good mental and physical health, emotional intelligence, successful human relationships, happy family life, satisfying work, sufficient income, good character, resilience. We'll come back to the last one. On a social level, he mentions freedom, quality of government. I think Draghi and Johnson have a lot to answer for on that one. Social support, the need to belong to a group or community, trust, peace, safety, compassion and caring, and sensitivity. And when Richard Layard talks about resilience, he says it means learning to look outside, not to look outside yourself for help, but inside yourself to look within for strength. Of course, life is not a bowl of cherries all the time for any of us. We know that it's got highs and lows and some people have had terrible traumas. But he says that you can recover from a trauma with post-traumatic growth. And that means you can, you'll still feel the trauma, you'll, you'll know about the trauma, but you'll get rid of all the anguish, the fear, the horror that goes with it. You can gradually train yourself to do that. And resilience means feeling in control of your life, apparently, this raises happiness by 11%, according to some research that was done at MIT. If you know your life is in control, you feel automatically happier. And there's also a need, he says, for us to feel we, be, we are needed by others, that they care about us, they value us. How many places have we worked in, any of us, where the staff just did not feel valued. It is a number one criterion to value other people and to feel valued by others. And that way we show love, respect and compassion. And we also need to encourage playfulness, imagination and creativity in ourselves and in others. And schools, he feels, should be teaching these things and life skills, healthy living, self-care, parenting, discipline, life goals, rather than allowing mobile phones, which are rather like a drug, and people sitting at computers for hours, like you're having to do now, I'm sorry to say. He says interaction is far more valuable to well-being. So we'll have a bit of that later. He wants children to know how to breathe properly, I was going to do some with you, but Jane did a wonderful breathing course two weeks ago, so I won't do that one. How to get rid of ego, competition, consumerism, how to learn delayed gratification 
rather than always going for immediate pleasure. And, and this is valuable, we need to learn how to stop catastrophizing. If one bad thing happens, our natural inkling is to think the worst and multiply it all over the place. But he says you can train yourself away from all that. So just as a bit of light relief, um, I would like you to pat your face all over the place. This, this is a good wake up, very good wake up every now and again, <laughs> pat it all over. And now, and this is the bit I love, massage your face. This is your third eye here. You put your two fingers there and go round and round and round. Support your elbow, it's easier. And then from there, start massaging the whole of your forehead, nice and deeply, really trust your fingers, go into all the areas you can feel. If there's anything slightly bruised or slightly stiff, just go along with it. And from there to the side of your, of your um, uh, front, I keep thinking in French, now I can't think in English anymore, forehead, round the side and go under the cheek. And here you feel a lovely deep cheekbone. So I want you to go right into your cheekbones and go round and round massaging it outwardly till you get to the edge. Start from the middle and then go out to the edge. Now a bit lower, start down here near the jawline and go out towards the edge. And then down here on the chin, around and round and round slowly. And then go under your chin and pull with your thumbs on both sides, right the way up to the top of your face like this, right the way up, right the way up, that's excellent. Now you're ready for a bit of what we call in English gurning. Gurning is making ugly faces by pulling every bit of your face. So, any horrible, horrible face, ah, open your mouth wide, tongue out. Don't be afraid, let yourself go. Pull the most horrible faces you can think of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah. Right, so now we've got our minds in gear. I'll uh, carry on a little bit um, about uh, Neuroplasticity, which Jane again touched on because our work seems to overlap quite nicely, actually. Richard Layard says that altruism is really at the heart of joy and pleasure. As you probably know, if you do nice things for someone else, you feel much better about it than they do some of the time. Um, and our uh, neuroplasticity in our brains means that the reward center in our brain lights up when we do something good for someone else in the same way as it lights up if you have chocolate, for instance, if you like chocolate, or if you uh, stroke a puppy, or if you see a beautiful scene, the same area of your brain will light up as when you're doing a good deed. So, and he says that our thoughts can change our feelings entirely. So we were talking about trauma, and if you've had trauma, Psychotherapists can help you reframe the way you think. It doesn't mean you're being brainwashed, but we have tremendously versatile brains. So if we have had a bad time, we can form new passageways in our brains. And if people after a stroke, for instance, as you know, if, if people have had a stroke, they can learn that another part of the brain takes over for them to move. And in a similar way, if you've had a bad time, you can take another part of your brain and learn the positive side and retrain it. There's a lot there, but I won't go into too much because uh, we've got a lot to get through. And of course, everybody now suddenly talks about meditation and mindfulness, which I've done for about 30 years. Uh, and that is a way of calming the mind, of taking all the thoughts 
not necessarily away from them, but being able to stand away objectively and see what is running around in your brain. Because one thing is we're all quite careful about not putting junk food into our bodies when we're eating. So why do we put junk thoughts into our minds? We have to have the same discipline as we do about healthy eating for healthy minds, putting positive thoughts into your mind. If you see something worrying or negative, look at it, don't get rid of it, but look and see what it's doing to you and try and reframe that sort of thinking in your mind. Music, for instance, is one very quick and direct way of reaching um, your mind and your emotions. Um, apparently ancient man enjoyed music at least 17,000 years ago because they found a conch shell in a cave and they played it recently and it had a beautiful tone. And it also had lots of, lots of um, drawings on it. And the drawings on the conch shell were the same as on the cave wall. So they realized that music and art in its early form had already started then. And really music goes straight to the heart. Unlike sex or food, there is no intrinsic value, but uh, they're still trying to work out with brain scanners what music does. So let us pause for a moment and let us see my, I love Vivaldi, he happens to be Italian, so you can be very proud. And I think music can make you feel joyful in two seconds. This is from uh, the Concerto for Strings in G Major, uh, better known as Alla Rustica. <laughs> What is the point of poetry? Um, uh, uh, we've just talked about music. Now we're linking into poetry and many people have tried to analyze why poetry is there and what it does to our emotions. And M Megan Williams, who's analyzed it in her book, The Joy of Poetry, says it's about nothing more or less than the pure joy of living, loving, being alive, in all its confusion and wonder, and it makes one a little more human. And poetry also helps us to know each other better and build community. Young children may not understand all the words at all, but they love the rhythms, they get curious about the sounds, maybe they even try and make their own poems, which may not make any sense. I shall just read you a tiny bit of an, um, a well-known British poem. I won't read it all the way through because uh, that would be painful, but uh, it's spring and you can almost guess if you're British what poem I'm going to read. It's William Wordsworth's The Daffodils uh, because the daffodils are coming out at the moment in England, but I'm only going to read you two verses, otherwise you'll fall asleep. <laughs> I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. 
For oft when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. There's something very consoling about poetry, especially when you already know the words and you come back and back to the same ones and they still give you that lovely rhythm. So before we carry on with a bit more head stuff, um, we'll unmute you to see how did, what would um, any comments you'd like to make so far about the way music and poetry make you feel? I know there's a lot of you, but uh, I'd be happy for any comments if you can unmute yourselves. And if you can't, it means you're so fascinated by the whole thing that, <laughs> that you just want me to carry on. <laughs> No comments so far. Yes, oh. no, can I, ah, I could, hello, I'm Marina. Marina. Well, I can, uh, yes, from experience, I, I uh, just uh, agree with uh, uh, what you have presented as uh, the consoling effects of music and poetry and dancing. Thank and uh, yeah, it has a great effect on me, particularly music and dancing. Oh. Thank you, Marina. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you for your comment. Any others before I carry on? Well, this, I agree with Marina. It's music mainly, but also poetry. Uh, music you know, is company for me when I'm alone and uh, I start thinking about things. So it's uh, like a, a trigger <laughs> for, uh, for emotions, for thoughts. Uh, uh, it helps a lot. Great, thank you very much. That's good to hear. Yeah, any more before I carry on? Uh, René? Uh, yes. I, I think Wordsworth is a fantastic uh, example because mm -hmm. uh, uh, words, uh, poetry, uh, was the concept of poetry was emotion recollected in a moment of a tranquility. And Beautiful. Uh, well, so <laughs> <laughs> and uh, see, I taught literature, so I'm used to it. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> And since we are locked down, we are all locked down in our homes and it's uh, difficult for us to have new experiences, to, uh, to feel new emotions. But anyway, we can uh, recollect uh, the, old, the old ones. We can have uh, sweet memories and feel happy the same. That is good and very positive. Thank, yeah. very, thank you, Maria. That's a very positive contribution. Thank you. And uh, part of the poetry, of course, is words. And uh, words are very powerful. So if we change the words we use, we also change perception and we change our own reality. So of what we see in the world. So if you want to see the world joyful, then use that kind of language. For instance, if you wake up in the morning, Say to yourself, even if it's not true, but it, the words go into the brain. The brain is a very silly, very simple little beast. It just hears words and it takes them literally. So if you start by saying, I feel great in the morning, then by golly, that does help. Especially if you say it a couple of times. If you start the day with a warm shower and stand in the shower and say, oh, I'm really enjoying the feel of the water going down my back and so on that lifts you a little bit more. And then perhaps say to yourself, I'm looking forward to today because, and find one reason why you could be looking forward to the day, because words really matter. For instance, it's much better to say, have confidence rather than don't be afraid. Better to say, make sure you remember rather than don't forget. And better to say, I'm not in a terribly good mood at the moment, rather than I'm feeling really sad. And if it's not such good weather, how about saying it's not brilliant today, but I'm sure the weather's going to brighten up by the end of the week. And while you're at it, replace being critical of yourself and others with being constructive. Because sometimes when you feel low, you're inclined to be even more negative and critical turn that into something constructive. We all learn to fail. Um, failure is part of life and it's very important and so is adversity. So 
There are many mottos that people use. One of my favorites during COVID, actually, they're all very simple ones, is if life brings you lemons, make lemonade. Uh, there are many well-known ones in English. They'll be different in Italian, but I'll give you some more English ones. Um, there's always someone worse off than you. Find pleasure in simple things. Be grateful for what you have. That's the most important. There's a Polish proverb, which means if you don't have what, what, get what you want, then enjoy what you have. Very useful maxim for enjoying life. And one from the uh, Marigold Hotel film, which tickled me. It all works out in the end. And if it hasn't worked out, then it's not the end yet. <laughs> a friend of mine whose father died recently uh, turned adversity into a good idea by um, finding, founding her own charity for stressed ICU workers, because she realized there wasn't one. So uh, there's always something good that can come out of something negative. And a lot of us are afraid of failure. Sometimes we don't even dare to do things because we're too afraid of, of having a big failure. I can give you a very good example because in America, I tried to get a job as a secretary and uh, they said, here's an electric typewriter. And I said, I, I, have you used one? I said, oh, of course. And I'd never used one in my life. So I thought, OK, I'll do this test. And I did the test. And I thought I was going really fast, which I was. And at the end, she looked at me and she said, Rini, I'm sorry. <laughs> because I thought the space bar was where the M was. So there was a long stream of letters. <laughs> with M's in between every word and no spaces at all. So it looked like complete gobbledygook. <laughs> so I remember that failure with, with fondness, <laughs> but I didn't get the job. Um, so just out of interest, can anybody give me an example of how they might have failed, but can look back at it with a, a little more fondness now? No, I won't press it if you don't want to, but if anything comes to mind. Yes, I have. Okay. <laughs> uh, I remember that when I went to university uh, um, centuries ago, uh, I took the first uh, written uh, exam in English, English written exam. And I was uh, so sure that I would uh, pass it because I had studied English for five years at the school. So I, said, mm -hmm. I don't need any, uh, any sort of um, uh, study beforehand. I'll go and I'll pass it. And of course I failed. And that was really a great uh, life lesson uh, because after that, I understood that what I had learned at the school uh, was not useful at all because the the way because at school we never said a word of English we never spoke it was only translations so I learned how to study English in a different way so mm -hmm. that that was really for me uh, a failure that I managed to turn into a, a change for the better turn to your advantage that is exactly right yes. thank you very much Marina thank if you. there are any more I shall carry on. I have one. Yeah, go on. In England, um, we do, we did something called O levels at 16, then our GCSEs, and at 18, A levels. Well, I discovered with O levels that it was, if you were going to fail, it was really good to fail as badly as you possibly could, because then you came out with the grade, which was a, a U. And this is unclassified. And the great thing was, if you got a U, it didn't appear on the certificate with the other exam results. <laughs> <laughs> you could actually just not declare it. <laughs> That's really clever. So it never showed up and nobody ever knew. No, so no one was any the wiser. <laughs> Terrific. Oh, thank you. Well, that, you see, failure can, can bring a lot of joy to a lot of people. Um, so uh, governments, by the way, uh, have a, a very different idea of uh, what their people want because the governments want a booming economy, heavy consumers who buy a lot, 
productivity, people who work very hard, but the gap is between what they want and what we want for ourselves. We want happiness, to enjoy life, to feel secure, to feel that uh, we are connected to other people, that we're connected to nature, that we feel fulfilled, and that we have some central purpose in our lives. And yet, Thomas Jefferson, who was president of the United States in the early 19th century, he said, the life and happiness of the people is the sole reason for government. I think that's a little lesson that uh, Johnson and Draghi should be learning right now. <laughs> so to sum up what we've done so far, before I go on to PowerPoint, um, really what we've learned from the pandemic as well, living with uncertainty, learning acceptance, gratitude, caring about our friends and neighbors, learning resilience, learning altruism, knowing what is important to prioritize in our lives, turning adversity and failure, which you've so beautifully shown me, uh, into something positive. And as the existentialists say, and also Aldous Huxley, Aldous Huxley said, experience is not what happens to us, but how we respond to what happens to us. In other words, we have 20,000 different choices if something good or something bad happens, but it's up to us to react in the most best beneficial way that we can. So you've been sitting patiently and before I go on to PowerPoint, we'll just do a little more exercise, Ziz. Because sitting still at a computer, I don't know about you, but I find that you do need to move yourself. So put your head as far as you can onto your shoulder, gently up as far as you can onto your other shoulder, gently up, forward, as low as you can from the neck. Gently up, don't hurt yourself, do it gradually. Back, gently up to the one side as far as you can go round. Turn gently back to the other side as far as you can go, as far, and gently back. Now I'm going to stand and I don't think you'll see me, but I'll tell you what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm swimming without water. So I'm going to do swimming with your legs and arms, bend your knees and up. This is breaststroke. Up, round, bend your knees down, keep your head straight and up. Take a deep breath as you go down. We'll do another three. One, Give it your whole heart. Pull out as much as you can on your arms. Pull your tummy in. Bend your knees as you go down. Up. Round. And the last time, pull your tummy in. Up. And round. Always useful to do when you're sitting at a computer for hours on end like we are at the moment. Right, now this is going to be a wonderful feat of uh, modern technology. I'm going to try and go into PowerPoint, which I will share the screen with Maria. So I'm just about to click on that. Click on PowerPoint.